Never has a fictionalised world completely immersed me more so than Blade Runner's 2019 Los Angeles. From enormous fireballs rising across a spread of scattered city lights to the breathtaking architecture of a dying world, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner achieves in one opening scene what so many other films have failed to do so in their full feature length running time. Blade Runner's world is one grounded in realism, yet so wonderfully bittersweet and cold that it comes with a dreamlike beauty. Throughout the film, the audience is left in a constant state of awe and near hypnosis due to the incredible artistry that went into constructing such a world. And who better to lead the way in that construction than a director with a background in the art of visual aesthetics? With thousands of television commercials under his belt, Ridley Scott captained the Blade Runner ship towards what would later become legendary cinematic status. Scott's cinematic ability was seen very early on in his more famous commercials, all the way into his second feature film, Alien, a film that visualises the terrifying and visceral side of space. But it wasn't until his follow-up film, Blade Runner, adapted from the groundbreaking Philip K. Dick novel, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, that Scott's visual mastery became fully realised. His ability to envelop the viewer into worlds he creates is one that many directors envy. He does this in a few ways, firstly by creating extreme depth in his shots. See here the multiple layers to the composition. From the falling snow in the foreground to the mannequins and neon lights reflecting off the storefront plexiglass in the middle ground into what is finally a dark void of gathering bystanders as they behold the aftermath of the replicant Zora's retirement. Scott is a master at this, and he jumps at the chance to add another layer to the frame whenever he can. Not only does this further the cloistered aesthetic he was going for, but it's also something that's visually extraordinary to behold. But before all of this comes another element of the production. Before the actual lighting, recording and camera setup comes the initial design of the production. And alongside Scott are a number of talented artists in their own right. First you have Sid Mead, the artist responsible for Blade Runner's revolutionary industrial concept designs that were the first step to creating the beauty of the film's world. From the sleek, futuristic designs of the multiple flying vehicles and infrastructure in the film, to the film noir-esque streets and cityscapes, reminiscent of Edward Hopper's paintings of New York City nightlife, Mead's illustrations provided what eventually turned out to be the film's primary visual aesthetic. It was Scott who actually noted Hopper's Nighthawks as the perfect illustration for the look and mood he desired for the film, so it's no surprise that the isolation and the emptiness of Hopper's work oozes off Mead's canvases also and such a bluesy tone is created with these drawings that when they're brought to life in the film, they're amplified by the character Rick Deckard, who himself is isolated, empty, and searching for a light in a world where it only seems to pour with rain. The film was shot on a limited budget on the Burbank Studios' backlot, a location featured in numerous Hollywood films, so many in fact that it's now become a popular attraction for tourists to get a glimpse of some of the behind the scenes of some of the most popular films in cinema. And with a location so well known and recognisable, came the difficult task of masking the studio as a world of the future, 37 years in the future to be exact. Production designer Lawrence Paul closely worked alongside Scott on the film, pulling together the art department that went on to develop the future Philip K. Dick had imagined. One way in which they did this was by retrofitting the backlot, by pulling the guts from the buildings and bringing them out to the exterior. Mazes of industrial pipes and grids wind around the architecture as significant elements of Sid Mead's futuristic designs. Another being the countless neon lights and signs spread out across the city. Glowing through crowds of people and reflecting off the rain-soaked pavements, there's a dirty quality that they bring to this dystopia. They only add to Scott's thoroughly layered framing too. Through thick fogs and pouring rain, this aesthetic that the art department of Blade Runner created proves much more powerful than the CGI-dominated landscape of world building today. And don't get me wrong, there is an art in modern digital technology, and in some aspects it's a less time-consuming, more cost-efficient practice. But there's a texture to practical effects that bring a raw feeling to the film, a nostalgia, a warmth. I mean, that's why I decided to call this video World Building on Film. What we're seeing is physical. Characters can reach out and touch things if needed. They can interact with their surroundings. Sure, this can't be said in every case in Blade Runner. Take, for example, the beautiful matte paintings created by the late great Matthew Jurisic, the artist behind a number of fantastic world-expanding matte paintings I'm sure we've all come across in the past without even realising it. 
However, with the invention of green screens and more importantly, digital technology, the practice of matte paintings has been more or less discontinued, with the exception of a few filmmakers keeping the practice alive in the digital age. However, they were such a huge advancement in filmmaking, and a historically important stage of Blade Runner in particular, that I want to take a second to talk about just why I, and so many others, have such a strong love for them. Now, without going too far in depth with the process, it being the complicated one that it is, I want to give a basic rundown of the process to example why it's so inventive. You can essentially break it down into two main steps, the first being the actual painting of the mat. In order for the effect to be achieved, an artist would spend weeks to months painting the effect onto a glass frame, leaving room for the actual film footage to be played alongside it. Take this example from the film, where Deckard looks over his balcony down towards the city streets. The matte painting here takes up a large majority of the frame, and you'll notice I've blacked out the live action part of the frame, meaning what you're seeing now is a recreation of what the original shot would have looked like, with a blacked out background space behind holes in the painted glass. Next, it would be the matte painting blacked out, and the live action footage would be projected onto the back of the glass, so it plays out through the hole in the glass. The film reel would then be rewound for a second pass of the scene, meaning the projected movement would then be added to the original film, all in camera. And with that, you're left with an expanded shot, as well as an expanded world. Similar in-camera techniques were used throughout the film. This opening shot of the skyline that stretches for miles took 17 passes with the camera to add every single detail possible. Exposure after exposure, what starts as 12 feet of 2D boards, miniature models and LED lights turn into miles of stretching landscape. The fog that diffuses the distant buildings not only adds a practicality to the shot, furthering the idea of maximum depth, but it also adds to the narrative of the polluted world of Philip K. Dick's novel. Dick even stated himself how blown away he was by these shots, how Ridley and the art department had plucked visions right out of his mind. Visions of a gritty, corroded world we see so much more of nowadays in fiction. Along with a few other sources like William Gibson's novel Neuromancer, Blade Runner forged the way for the subgenre that was ultimately titled Cyberpunk, a vision of grit and impurity rooted in the origins of science fiction, a vision that paved the way for so many more groundbreaking stories. And next up to add to the multitude of stories is the sequel to Blade Runner, directed by Denis Villeneuve. It'll be interesting to see just how the Blade Runner mythology and legend is approached. From the trailer alone, we can see the exclusively in-camera techniques are for the most part absent, which doesn't surprise me one bit. It's something even Scott has happily welcomed into his more current work, and with new technology at hand at the peak of the digital age, a new Blade Runner story can be pretty much taken anywhere. I thoroughly enjoyed Villeneuve's previous films before this one, so I have good faith that I won't be disappointed. But I'd be lying if I said I won't miss the miniature models and the matte paintings and the all-around analog creation of the original movie. For it was, and still is, the greatest envisionment of the future ever put to film.